Hello, everyone. I think we can start now. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lecture, 2041, How Chinese Science Fiction Images Our Future. I'm Song Han. I'm no the famous sci-fi writer, but another writer and a PhD student in comparative literature at Cornell University. This year, I'm serving as the chair of GSSC, the Graduate Student Steering Committee of the East Asia Program. Our goal is to facilitate interdisciplinary dialogues on East Asia related topics within and beyond Cornell University. It is truly an honor for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Stanley Chufan Chen. Professor Chen is one of the most important sci-fi writer in the Chinese speaking world. His major works include Waste Tide, Huang Chao, a contemporary um, eco-techno uh, thriller classic, Future Diseases, Weilai Bing Shi, and uh, Algorithm for Life, Ren Sheng Suan Fa. Uh, these works have won him three Chinese Galaxy Awards and 15 Chinese Nuclear Awards. His recent works include AI 2041, uh, co-authored with Dr. Kai Fu Li, in which he imagines our world in 20 years and how it will be shaped by AI. This book's simplified Chinese edition, AI Will I Jin Xing Shi, just published. No matter, no matter you are in States or China, remember to buy a copy. It is pity that uh, Professor Bachner will not join us today, but after Professor Chen's lecture, we will have Professor Anidita Banerjee from the Department of Comparative Literature, an award-winning expert on science fiction, uh, to join our discussion. And for the Q&A session, you can either type your question in the chat or raise your hand, and we will call your name. I would also uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Amelia Lane from the East Asia Program for her kind coordination and Department of uh, Comparative Literature for the co-sponsorship. Now, without further ado, please join me to welcome Professor Chiu Fan Chen. Thanks, Han Song, and thanks, Professor Banerjee, and thanks everyone for having me to this privileged um, Cornell uh, online lecture. So. Yeah, I'm right now um, in uh, LA, California, as the Futures in Resident uh, for Sci Arc. So I'll spend a couple of months here um, working with some students and also the researchers here to explore uh, um, how we can leverage science fiction as a tool, as a narrative to help to um, speculative design, no matter on architect like city whatsoever. So I'm pretty happy to be here and now I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, here we go. So, so today I'm um, majorly focused on the recent publication, which um, it was, uh, 2041, uh, 10 future, uh, 10 visions for our future, collaborating with uh, Dr. Kai Fu Li. So um, let me start. Okay, so I start from this very famous um, quote from Harari. So he mentioned that today's science fiction could be the most important artistic genre um, to help us to uh, prepare and perceive uh, the, the future like forthcoming with the challenges and risk brought by technology. So we have to ask what is science fiction really? So this is one of my favorite um, definition I found online because there are so many different definitions uh, across the history and also like uh, in different um, countries, different culture, we all, all have different definitions on science fiction. So I think this one is precisely enough to uh, give you a, a, a description of what is science fiction. So it's a branch of literature 
that deal with human responses to change uh, to changes in the level of science and technology. But for sure, the the terms I use different colors here is like arguable because right now we all know that science fiction or sci-fi in general is way more broader than literature itself, but it also like tap into the field of like TV, film, game, uh, also our other artistic formats like NFT and metaverse. And also like human, I think there's something arguable as well because right now we have this kind of very strong movement about the human centric. And also we're talking about uh, the end of the scene. So right now we're considering as other species, just like um, animals, plants, maybe a uh, microbe and AI for sure, could be some kind of um, agency with uh, consciousness or maybe intelligence as well. So talking about level of science and technology for sure, because we know that science fiction is a quite broad spectrum that you can find anything like for example, in China, people always ask me, like, uh, you, you write science fiction, right? So um, Harry Potter must be your thing. So I would say, okay, Harry Potter, yeah, it did won, uh, it, it, it won the Hugo Award back in the day. But we'll say, like, it's pretty much fantasy rather than science fiction. But now with, it seems to me like the, the borderline is getting blurred because right now as science and technology is still evolving and there's so many things we use to consider it as non-scientific um, theories or pra uh, practice right now can be, will be included into the, the realm as well. So as you can see, it's quite flexible. It's kind of dynamic change uh, according to the time. So, but we also want to ask, so because as a Chinese writer, so we have to confront all this kind of questioning about what is the use of writing and reading science fiction because, you know, we're being very practical on everything. So we can find so many proofs in history of technologies, which is um, like from all those very famous invention back in the day, like modern submarine. And it is so-called to be uh, inspired by uh, Duverne's uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea and also like mobile phone. Uh, back in the day, the engineers, uh, Martin Cooper, who used to work for Motorola back in the 70s, he admit, admitted that he got his idea from Star Trek, um, which, in which uh, Captain Kirk walking along the Enterprise with the small uh, electronic devices in his hand and he can talk to his crew like anytime. Uh, not to mention the, 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 the iPad, the, the, the tablet PC, which is firstly be seen in 2001 Space Odyssey, and also the very latest version of VR or Metaverse. We can see all those classic uh, science fiction and movie from Snow Crash, from Ready Play One, uh, from all those things, even like uh, all those who invented the goggles, they would say, okay, this is something I st steal from the fiction because from engineering level, it seems so realistic that then I can make it into a product like, like immediately. So I, I have to say that there's so many myths about how science fiction inspired tech people, engineers to make some progress or breakthrough on science and technology. But I have to say this is, to me, it's like always 
um, indirect or is much more complicated than it looks like in the narrative. So if we look at, if we look deeper into, for example, the timeline of AI in real world and put it together with the, the narrative in science fiction, you can see all this kind of interesting and also very complex entanglement between the two. For example, like Asimov, back in the golden age, he started to write about all these stories about robots, thinking machines. But this quite famous paper written by Alan Turing actually is coming afterward in 1950. That's the starting point of everything. And during this up and down, of AI development, actually so many science fiction writers, even scientists making this kind of prediction like how soon we can create a machine with the general intelligence of a human being, but actually they, they all make it wrong. So until nowadays, we still have this kind of uh, mythology of like how we can create a machine to think and making decisions just like human beings. But I think this is something totally in the wrong direction. I'll come back to that later. So I think this is kind of projection actually is going all the way down since the very beginning of uh, science fiction back in the day of 1818 when Mary Sherry uh, wrote Frankenstein because we always try to portray, we always try to uh, project all this kind of fear and flavor on the otherness. And how we gonna get through this, this, is, this could be a very interesting uh, thinking and could be the starting point of the next level of science fiction in the future. So I'm gonna push back um, backward to uh, focusing on China because we all know that we have three booms of Chinese science fiction. And I think because the drama itself, it was invented and developed in mostly like Western countries like US and UK. And China actually, actually as, a, as a country which introduced um, this genre only 120 years ago. So it's kind of new and young in the domain. And also we can see this kind of interesting response um, in different, uh, in each room. So I think they are like, uh, we need to put each boom back in the, uh, context of the history because you can see this is the first boom it was happened in the uh, late Qing dynasty so you can see how Liang Qi, Chao and Lu Xun they try to introduce the genre of science fiction and responds to the question of the tension between history of the past and the future and it's totally a, a a paradigm shift to me because all this kind of tradition, historical uh, uh, heritage is kind of something stop them from um, pushing the society evolve. So that's a pretty uh, Eastern perspective of like sociology because we all know that in the ancient I know we don't have this, that kind of linear a uh, 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 historical uh, uh, concept, like everything is just like recycling, like a dynasty after dynasty. But um, science fiction actually is something help us to think beyond that. It's something we can create a new perspective of society, nation, and towards the direction of future. So I think that's something happen from time to time because in each one of this boom we need to answer specific question of who we are where we are 
and, and, and what's the direction we're heading to. So see, this is the second boom, um, which is right up to the Cultural Revolution, starting from the best-selling um, uh, science fiction, uh, Xiaoling Wei written by Mr. Ye Yong Lie. So actually, it's quite a short boom, so it only lasts for five years. So interestingly, because in this period of time, the, the major question around science fiction itself as a genre is talking about whether it should belong to science and technology or belong to humanity, just like literature and art. So because there's so many, there were so many famous scientists just like um, Qian Xuesen, they, they accusing science fiction, just spreading the pseudoscience. So even this kind of battle and, 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 and argument is like uh, broadcasting on major official media, just like People's Daily. So which is become a big thing back in the day. So I think this, some, this is actually tapping to the question which coming along with the long history of uh, the, the, the re relationship between fiction and reality also because of the historical tradition of like uh, revolution literature back in the day. So that's how we learn from uh, Soviet Union. And also we can see we, we learn we, we, we learn a lot of things like uh, institution, uh, institutional uh, setting from, from uh, Soviet Union and in Soviet Union back in the day, they using science fiction as a tool to um, popularizing science knowledge, scientific knowledge and, and, and experience. So I think definitely China was tracking that kind of um, um, heritage as well. So we, we can see that in the second boom, uh, science fiction writers, they failed like Mr. Ye Yonglie, he gave up writing science fiction anymore. So he turned to writing some um, biographic of like politicians later on. So now we are in the third wave is so called a new wave by Professor Song Mingwei. And it's the, the starting point, I would say it's very interesting because uh, we all know that um, in um, science fiction world, which is still the only uh, major science fiction magazine in China. And in 1999, there's a, a, a feature article talking about what if a memory can be transferred is actually coincidentally sharing the same title with the uh, essay of entering exam Gaokao that year. So it created this kind of vibe or, or fantasy about like uh, you, 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 can, you can get in a very good school, you can get a good score in the Gaokao uh, by reading science fiction. So everyone, like all the teachers, uh, parents, students, they, they, they just can't wait to uh, read science fiction and it make the, the magazine become uh, one of the biggest um, 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 science fiction magazine all over the world. And that year actually is the year uh, Mr. Liu Cixin published his short story, Wandering Earth. And also that was the year Mr. Guo Fan, the, the director of the Wandering Earth, went to Gaokao. So he, you know, here history uh, make a very interesting joke and it kind of self uh, reveal self with this kind of like um, superpower or whatsoever. So it's like interconnecting um, different people with science fiction, like 20 years later, The Wandering Earth directed by Guo Fan, adapted from the story by Liu Cixin, make it a phenomenal uh, blockbuster uh, uh, in China. So this is the 
I think this is the beginning of like how the whole society, like no matter from the government, from the film industry, or from the mass market, they start to think about like take science fiction or science fiction movie very seriously because it create a huge, um, huge topic to the people and also create this kind of huge interest to the capital that there is, this is something represent the progress we've, we've been making um, during the past four decades up to the reopening and, and reform and everything is, is accelerating like e economy, technology, and the, 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 the national power right now is science fiction, it's represent the cultural soft power. So that's something the government definitely love to see. And also we have to talk about Liu Cixin and his three body problem, which starting a new phase of Chinese science fiction, which is gonna answer one question is could science fiction be something Chinese characteristic because the genre itself is actually introduced from the west so we're struggling with this kind of identity issue like whether it belongs to nation or uh, is like something like sharing the universal uh, value on as ethically or like on the theme or on, on, on whatsoever characters within the genre. So we invented or can we define it in a more Chinese way? So this is calling the Chinese science fiction uh, question. So we've been asked so many times, like what made the Chinese science fiction Chinese? So, but to me, like all this question we've been asked is always about the tension, about the anxiety of like how we can identify ourselves. So in the world, in the genre, in the cultural market. So actually there are this different phases, there are the different angle of the same question is about the confidence, you know. So so to me, science fiction is not necessary to have anything about promoting or evoking science and all technology. So what we can learn from science fiction really. I think from the brief introduction of Chinese science fiction history, we can see we're all trapped in this kind of binary thinking. We have to deal with all this kind of dual, uh, dualism, like past and future fiction and reality, humanity and science and technology, national and international self and otherness. But I think the, the, the right now to me is like more importantly, we science fiction is something can help us to think beyond all those binaries and it gives us this kind of cognitive flexibility and fluidity to help us to think beyond ourselves. And we can see things from different perspective. And that's how we share, how we are gonna create some consensus beyond all this kind of boundaries no matter it's on culture, on language, on nationality, ideology, or even uh, belief system. So I think this is why science fiction, it seems to me so important in the foreseeable future. And that's why I'm gonna talking about the book AI 2041 is actually the practice of this kind of thing beyond philosophy. So first thing I want to talk about is thing beyond technology because this is something um, 
in China, we uh, have this kind of tradition on reading science fiction since uh, golden age. So actually it's kind of quite, um, it's positive about the future created by technology and also like it's kind of a session, a serrationism that we believe technology can solve whatever or even like most of the problems, um, even it was creating more problems. So if the technology evolve fast enough, we can solve all of them. But to me, it seems like this is totally not true. So two years ago, my, um, my ex-colleague uh, uh, in Google, uh, Dr. Kai Kuli is also the AI uh, expert investor. So back in the days in 1980s, he actually studied AI in Kaneki Melon. So he's the one um, who understand AI for sure. So two years ago, he reached out to me and, and pitched me with this idea, like how about we collaborate on a, a book together because we all know that he wrote a very successful book on AI, it's called AI Superpower. So talking about like um, China and America, they're competing on AI. So yeah, so, 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 so China might take advantage on the, the big data and infrastructure, everything. So I, I'm, I have to admit that at first I'm kind of hesitating because we all know like uh, nobody wants to work with your Xbox. So back in the day, we share some time in Google. So I spent five years in Google China. So I think he's that kind of CEO person, um, he's kind of bossy. So as a writer, I mostly um, writing by myself, I can do whatever I, I want, but if you work with the boss, so that means there, there'll be a lot of like back and forth discussion and maybe like some kind of compromise for sure. But afterward, I'm thinking about this is something I really should do because there are so many misunderstanding, so many um, misleading in mass media about AI and robots. So I think, yeah, why not? So because he can bring in the idea of real science, scientific facts and experience in the industry about how AI got to evolve over the next 20 years and I can make it into stories. So that's how we start the collaboration. So we spent the first, I think, um, six months, we interview, we have meetings with so many AI researchers, um, professors, even those who are doing the real thing in the lab or in the startup companies. So we, we sit down together and map out the roadmap of how AI technology will evolve in the next 20 years. And we pick up different technology points like facial recognition, computer, and, um, deep fake, natural language processing, et cetera, et cetera. And we try to put, it, put them into different boxes just like a package. And from each package, we need to attach to different serial. And that comes to me like um, it, the most important or difficult or challenging part is how you can find a coherent um, storytelling, which is kind of attached to each technology package. Meanwhile, make it compelling. So as like each time around the package, I'll, I'll bring out different direction on storytelling. And Dr. Kai Fulio uh, gets back to me like, this is not gonna happen in the next 20 years, or this is too dark, 
or this is I don't like it. Just basically, he don't like it, and I that and then I can I I have to go back and come up with something new. So that's how we collaborate, and and I, I finish one story, and he give me some feedback, and I'm gonna make a little bit change of this, and and all that. So I think we team up in a very efficient way, just like a project managing management. And I think thanks to him, that's how we gonna finish the book in a pretty much uh, uh, disciplined and efficient way because simultaneously there are some brilliant translator like working on translated from Chinese to English and because Dr. Kai Fuli, he wrote in English, so there are some translators uh, did it backwards. So we will send it to the editor in New York from Penguin Random House. So they'll give us some feedback and we'll do it like some revisions simultaneously. So everything is just like clicking. So the clock is clicking because I made up the name like 41 because AI, it looks pretty much like 41. So that's, that's a word play. So that means we have to finish the book like six months right before the publication date. So that's, that's quite a um, tight schedule, I have to say. It's quite unusual in, in the publication industry in US. Even like in China, I would say it's pretty, it's, it's pretty intense, but luckily we managed it. So I was gonna show you a little bit of the promotion video. We met in a virtual reality game. He lives in Brazil, I live in China. Soon we were messaging all day and night. After two years, he wants to meet in person, but how can we meet when I'm afraid to leave my apartment? Outside these walls, the pandemic rages on, a permanent threat. AI helped discover vaccines, but the virus mutates fast. Inside these walls, I'm safe. The building's robots bring me everything. Does a relationship require contact? What is love for the COVID generation? This is AI 2041. So... So this story actually set in Shanghai, which seems to me um, is like a pretty ironic story for now. So because um, when people read this story, they'll say, no way, 20 years, COVID, are you serious? So yeah, we'll see. So, uh, so this story, actually, you can see different layer beyond technology. Um, for example, you tap into AI, healthcare and like uh, vaccine development with AlphaFold and also like uh, tracing um, people with digital human in the metaverse and also like biosensor attached to your skin that can have people read your uh, status of vaccination, et cetera. So it's convenient, it's safer, but it also like, allows to move and interact with uh, the society as free as you want. So actually it's a story about a girl who was traumatized by her childhood uh, experience of COVID um, and tried to step out of her comfort zone, which um, by like a game, like a gamification, um, experience created by her boyfriend. So actually we're talking about psychology and, and, and spirituality in the post COVID age. So that's how I gonna bring the story from AI or technology rele uh, relevant to the next level to bring in more social issues and also tap into the field which my more complex and with 
more nuance on humanity. So this is the question I would love to respond about like um, being a Chinese science fiction writer, what make us, um, what to reflect our Chinese-ness in our writing. So because right now I think it's necessary to me. So in this book, actually I try to put each story in each, in different countries, different societies so of course people might argue that this is cultural appropriation but i'll try myself i'll try my best to as authentic and nuanced as i could i did a lot of research and also i've been to like most of the cities i i i, I wrote in the book and also i have some um some friends who leaving the cities like India, um, Mumbai, and also like I have friends to visit um, Lagos, Nigeria, and spend so many years there. So I try to make each, like all these details as plausible as, uh, as I could. So this is the story uh, happened in Lagos, Nigeria is talking about a gay boy. Um, living in a very uh, struggling um, uh, condition because Nigeria uh, didn't allow same-sex marriage. So it's talking about a girl, how to, a, a, a boy, how to use his special technique of deep fake to create some uh, false identity on social media that can maintain his uh, social life and romance but he was getting involved to some political scandal and there's something happened afterward. So in this story, like um, deep fake could be something accessible for everyone and is cheap enough and is fast enough. So the major websites, especially those uh, official sites, they need to launch this kind of filter to identify which was generated by AI, which is not. So this is totally something could happen in the foreseeable future and how we can distinguish facts from rumors because the, the technologies become so accessible and how we gonna deal with our perception of reality for sure because each one of us could living in a different bubble of reality. So everything we see, everything we connect to is actually uh, future manipulate, altered by a specific media. So all this media have that some kind of specific party with interests or political standing uh, behind the scene. So that's the problem. Like we don't know what is real in the post true age. And this story happened in Tokyo, Japan is talking about like fandom economy and entertainment industry with using all this kind of XR technology with digital human NLP, we can create this kind of um, super realistic and, and smoothly interact uh, virtual idol. So, and, and in the story, actually, we're talking about the these uh, decentralized power of storytelling. Like right now, we accept the characters. We 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 all embraced the idols, which was quite centralized. But in the future, in my perspective, like each one can like customize their own idol and they can tell in their own stories to play, to interact with this virtual identity. And also the stories set in Seoul, Korea is talking about like customized education. So how can we offer each kid customized educational resource equal to break uh, exacerbate class division, which is happening 
around the world. So this is the, the book, How to Unfold the Futures of AI in Different Society with Different Cultural Background and also with different kind of class and identity. So also there are so many stories in the book. Uh, um, if you have interest, you can check it out. So there's like Australia talking about climate change and species extinction and also autonomous weapon across Europe, job displacement in California, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this, all these challenges ahead of us beyond the borders of countries, society and ideologies. So it requires wisdom and belief from, from humankind to think and act beyond binary and boundaries. So science fiction could play the role as the interface to inspire and mobilize people to reshape a flexible and flexible future oriented mindset and culture. So we can become something, some species with compassion. So I think this is something really urgent. And also we try to push the boundary a little further, not only limit to books, literature and text itself. We collaborating with uh, the emerging NFT uh, platform PR Lab who successfully launched Cai Guo Qiang, uh, NFT, first NFT of firework. And we invited a digital artist to create um, different artwork based on each story in, in the book. Right. So also we have we have like engaged with the readers on her uh, Discord and we launched some um, treasure hunting uh, games with the readers and also we are curating an offline exhibition of NFT in Shanghai which is supposed to open in March 26 but because of COVID it was postponed to I don't know when it's gonna be happen but we did a lot of things to engage and beyond the book itself to create this kind of narrative from different dimension. So I think this totally trigger more um, provoking more thinking and discussion around the topics um, we try to discuss in the book. And also we went to different uh, summits and conference uh, in different domains like AI in tech and climate change we reached her and also went to tech Montreal. So I think this is so important to tap into different people, not only science fiction fans, but also tech engineers, policy maker, education, and also stakeholders, I think, in general. So I think everyone's supposed to care about what we're thinking and they should contribute a little piece of what they've been thinking and doing. So we can start to talking about some real uh, important issue. So the final I have to say is we have to think beyond human um, from science fiction because is something we've been doing during the previous 2000, uh, two, 200 years since Mary Sherry. So we keep creating the others, no matter it's like a monster, alien, or AI or robots. And all this kind of imagery is here is from very classic by movie and TV series. 
So how we can create a different imagination of AI beyond the binary of beer flavor? My answer is like to work with it. So this is how I start to collaborate with AI since 2017, which was actually the year Google launched Reattention Mechanism and Transformer. And Transformer actually is the, the, the foundation of GPT, which was launched a year later by OpenAI. So right now we have the super powerful tool, GPT-3. It can automatically generate a lot of things like paragraph of uh, like articles, or even you can use it to uh, coding and et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the starting point, how I gonna collaborate with machine. And it also give me some very surprising result, which is maybe one of my first, uh, lifetime, I beat the Nobel Prize on literature, Mr. Ben, in the AI literature competition, which the jury is also another AI. And, uh, uh, an AI recognize some story written, collaborate with another AI as the best. So this is something totally science fictional and surreal beyond my imagination. So like in 2020, we upgrade the algorithm, we're using GPT-2 and we pre-training and fine tuning it to write science fiction. And we also invited different more like science fiction writer and even mainstream writer, uh, Mr. Xiaobai, Lu Xun Wen Xue Jia, winner. Um, so to join the project and we call it co-creation. So I think what we try to create here is um, this kind of new attitude, not fear or flavor, but to um, proactively um, engage and interact with technology such as AI to get the deeper understanding and actually we're co-evolved together because we're feeding data, we're feeding ourselves into the machine. And also machine is like changing our perception and cognition in the other way. So I think this kind of feedback loop is actually tapping into the spirit of cybernetic back in the day when Macy's conference happened in, I think it was 1948. So this kind of things like is totally fascinating because right now the acceleration of everything in cutting edge physics and mathematics is actually helping us to reshape our understanding of the reality. So here is a quote from Dr. Joshua Kim. So he's, he's using the book to teaching the students and he thinks this is quite an elegant method to, for looking backward from the future. And, and I think this is totally something important for the next generation because they, they are the ones who to confront all this kind of geopolitic conflicts and even separationism of ideology. So I think the important thing is how we can maintain this kind of mobility and flexibility, um, no matter it's culturally or uh, philosophically, is how we gonna see a whole picture beyond ourselves. And I think this is the only way out for a human civilization. Then we can reconnect together to, to confront, to get, up, to, to, to get over some tough problems just like climate change or nuclear war ahead of us. So this is what I'm gonna share today. So think beyond and take action starting from reading or writing science fiction. So thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Chen, for sharing with us this fascinating history of science fiction, uh, Chinese science fiction, and also telling how literature 
can change the world. And I'm so impressed by the, you know, your multimedia writing. It is very impressive and revolutionary to see how literature can be so different in this era of AI and uh, technology. Um, so now I, I would like to welcome Professor Anidita Banerjee to share uh, her thoughts. Professor Banerjee's research focuses on science fiction and technology studies, environmental humanities, media studies, and migration studies across Russia, Central Asia, and Indian subcontinent, and Latin and African Americas. Her first book, We Modern People, Science Fiction and Making of Russian Modernity, won the Science Fiction and Technoculture Studies Book Prize from the University of California. Please, Professor Energy. Thank you, and, and it's an honor uh, to meet uh, Dr. Chen. Um, I have long been a fan of your work. I will not take up too much time in my remarks and questions because I can see hundreds of precisely those next generations your AI 2041 is calling to. But <clears throat> it's very, um, um, uh, for me, it's, it, it, it was very gratifying to hear that somehow there has been a convergence or a singularity in my approach to science fiction, which I always asserted was not just your way of reacting to modernity, anticipating modernity, thinking and feeling modernity, but making modernity, this is in the title of my book, in a historical context, what you do is to make it into a practice, this thesis. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm uh, uh, teaching a course on science fiction at Cornell this semester, as I do most years. And it is precisely the kind of vision that you lay, uh, lay out uh, in this new project that I think uh, the next generation wants to hear because they are eager to take action. They're eager to act upon. You know, it is no longer, um, it's, it's, a, it's an existential issue for them, you know, to go from the binary of thinking and acting into doing both together at the same time because time is so short. Um, if I may um, uh, refer, however, to uh, a couple of works um, that um, I hold dear and I teach very often, both in my science fiction course, but also in my courses on, um, on the environment and the environmental wicked problems that, uh, that are perhaps at the forefront of many young people that you're asking to take action in this transmedial, translingual, transnational ways um, is, uh, is of course your novel Waste Tide, uh, but also several of your short stories. And what I've always loved about uh, Waste Tide and let me think, my favorite short story of yours uh, is translated into English as Smog Society. Yeah, you recognize. And what I love about those uh, works, previous works, and what my students love about those previous works is that, that it is always simultaneously conscious of what actually remains invisible behind our uh, binary relationship with science fictional others, as you said, between fear and, and, and love, right? And that, it, those are, you know, the arenas of um, dirty work, simply you know, the production of waste, the workers, you know, the in waste tide, right? The places and the people who are immersed, who are living through literally the byproducts of all technology, including AI, which is the subject that uh, whom we don't see, whom we don't encounter. And your science fiction introduces this whole other world, the smog society hero, you know, who cannot afford a face cream for her, for his wife, so she can protect herself from air pollution, right? So where do these problems that have not gone away from the realm of technology or AI, 
where are they in your new AI 2041? Yeah, ah, thanks, uh, Professor Benerji. So I think in AI 2041, we're actually tapping to uh, climate change and environmental issue as well. There's one story um, uh, entitled Quantum Genocide. Is a talking about a, a, a quantum physics scientist when a uh, goes crazy because his family was killed in a climate e extreme mm -hmm. incident. So he tried to revenge to the whole society, which is create this massive terrorism um, attack by autonomous weapon. So the, in, in, in my imagination, like the future, this kind of thing could highly, uh, very likely to happen because um, if you're rich enough, so you can easily mm -hmm. using all those autonomous manufacturing to build up something and it can, um, um, execute some kind of massive attack on human civilization, but not necessarily near human army. So I think what we're discussing here is about the complex between technology and the, the, the nature, how to balancing the two. And also there's another story, uh, it's called uh, Planetude of Dreaming. Uh, the dreaming of planet two is talking about in future Brisbane, Australia, like how people using clean energy, AI robotic technology to protect the greater uh, barrier reef. Mm -hmm. So because that's something everyone's concerning about and is talking about how we're gonna introduce indigenous uh, knowledge and experience mm -hmm. into the technology because right now it's like out of our sight because all this technology we create basically from the West, right? So it's Western culture dominant, but actually I believe there's so many things critically important there in indigenous minority um, traditions. So how we can translate all those knowledge and experience and to embed it into our current framework. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think this is something we need to see and we need to recognize it. Otherwise, there'll be totally missing parts in our society. So that's my thought in the book, but I'm working on more about the, the, the issue itself. So I think climate change and in a environmental issue is something I'll work on that for quite a long time, maybe my lifetime, because there's something we need to fight, fight for it, right? So, so for our offspring, for our civilization, or even for the whole planet as, a, as, as, as one, I don't know, like integral uh, ecological circle. So we need to play a more important role, right? Thank you so much. And I see people are already putting up hands and putting in questions. So I'm going to thank you again. And I do look forward to this and future works. Thanks, Han. Yeah, thank you so much. Now we are open for the Q&A session. You can either uh, type your question in using the chat function or uh, raise your hand. Uh, now uh, we have a question from Mr. Michael Nelson, please. Thank you very much, and thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, I've been working on tech policy in Washington, D.C. for over 30 years, um, most recently at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. But in my spare time, I'm on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation. Oh, cool. We acknowledge, we try to foster the memory of, of Arthur C. Clarke and try to encourage other people who are thinking about the future and using the arts and engineering to shape our future. So um, 
uh, three years ago, we gave our in a, a Imagination Award to Xi Jin Lu, and he gave a fascinating talk about how science fiction influenced his perception of the future. Um, I've also taught at Georgetown uh, a, a class called How to Predict the Futures. And we spent some time looking at science fiction as a way to, to model different imaginary worlds. Um, but my question was, you, you mentioned how in the, the third, the second boom of Chinese science fiction, there was a pretty large impact from translated Russian science fiction. I'd be interested to know how current readers in China are, um, experiencing more, more recent science fiction and whether they're, they're also reading some of the classics from a hundred years ago, like Jules Verne. So is there, a, is there, a, is there a, a certain type of science fiction from outside of China that's popular in China? And what, what is the impact of that? Um, and and I, I'd just be very interested to know what, what science fiction writers non-Chinese -science, non science fiction writers are popular today and, and why you think they're popular and how it may be shape, shaping perceptions about the future. Right, right. Thanks, Michael. That is a very good question. So I think- it's Actually about five questions, which is a little unfair. <laughs> so answer, answer whichever ones you like. Sure. Yeah, I think because um, the, the tradition of, um, you know, like we're pretty much focusing on the function of like popularizing science and technology, which was actually learned from Soviet Union. So that kind of in tendency actually brought in a lot of like um, golden age works. So we're pretty much is shaping the taste of the audience because all the editors, all these uh, magazines, publishers, they'll choose those with like so-called hardcore science fiction back in the day. So I think that's kind of shaping the taste of one generation. So it's still there, the momentum is still there. So I can see in recent years, um, the, um, I think, the most popular US science fiction of modern times, besides all those classic like Asimov, uh, Clark, and I will say is <clears throat> um, anywhere. So the Martian and Project Hail Mary. So because he's that kind of very geeky and hardcore sci-fi, which, and also with the movie directed by uh, Ridley Scott is phenomenal. So I think that's something for now, like still huge in, in, in Chinese market, but also I can see there's new emerging um, um, current like Lamb, um, Stanislav uh, Lamb from Poland, so because last year was his uh, 100 year anniversary. Um, so there are, I think it was six or eight books got translated and published for the first time. So I think it's quite interesting because Lamb reminds me like how he lived in a post-Soviet country so, but he still maintained the relationship with the US science fiction community, which he's kind of sharing this kind of flexibility and mobility between the two superpowers. And all his stories are quite strongly using this kind of meta metaphorical style and it, Actually, he will put a lot of story in a very vogue and fictional background. Could be in the US, some like fictional town, but actually talking about everything happened in Poland or in Soviet Union. So that's something 
always trigger me and always like you can relate to it like uh, instantly. So I think that's something Chinese audience also feel it. It's something beyond technology and science, but it's mostly about this, the, the society and the humanity. So I think Lamb is definitely one of my favorite, but also like Clark is one of my all time favorite. Uh, so I think this is something, yeah, in the future, I think Lamb, its value will like be, become more and more important, like even in China. So because it's totally sharing the same experience as we do uh, in the present day. So that's my answer. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. I yeah. wanted to interject for just a second because um, um, I don't know if you know this and perhaps the audience would be interested. Um, MIT Press has been releasing the new translation, English translations of the entire corpus of Stanislav Lem's works. And I've been involved in that project from its foundation and I'm very, very proud of the new translations. They really bring Lem out in a completely new way for English speaking audiences. Thank you, looking forward to yeah. that. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Our next question comes from Zhang Han. Uh, he is a PhD candidate uh, of uh, global development here at Cornell. Yeah, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much, Chu Fan, for your wonderful talk. It really um, insightful. And yeah, you in your um, talk, you mentioned about the knowledge that is special um, in the Chinese science fiction. Can, um, my question is, can you elaborate a little bit more on that point? Um, to be more specific, um, do you think the Chinese science fiction actually add knowledge um, that it, or imagination um, of AI, um, of uh, modernity and even humanity um, that is different from like the Western world? Um, or the earlier um, industrialized and capitalized war. Um, and uh, yeah, or do you think like they share uh, more similarity and uh, coming from like the uh, same lineage? Um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been talking to um, some journalists um, um, writing about like, how science fiction and uh, influenced uh, tech, tech, tech industry uh, and also how government tried to leverage it in China. So um, one thing I think is quite inspiring is like um, what China is doing now is quite similar to what US did back in the 1960s. So when they launching the Apollo and yeah, you know, the space expedition pro programs. So I think that's totally the same kind of vibe, but yeah, because right now the whole nation is trying to, I think they're trying to build up their confidence no matter on economy, technology, on culture level so i think the 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 easiest way to build up this kind of confidence is like look we can do whatever they did back in the day right so they can go to the moon they can land it on mars and they can build up a space station so can we so i think this is a very interesting attitude like right now people how they respond and thinking on technology so i think so basically we uh, uh in my generation we were born and raised 
um, after the Cultural Revolution. So everything seems to going upward. So it's called the progress. So everything is going towards a more positive, more promising future. And this kind of positive, optimistic on technology and what it brought, brings to us, it seems to be like hugely shaping our um, writing as well. So I, as I as I can see, like most of the stories here, it's kind of not to say rosy colored, um, science optimistic, but as in general, uh, quite positive and bright about what technology can bring to us. So it's talking about how people's life been changed because of the invention of certain kind of uh, uh, technology. So even those dystopian ones, you can see the solution of the story is always by introducing some even newer technology to the story. It's like, like Deus Ex Machina, that kind of uh, setting. So yeah, so that's, I think right now we're lacking the imagination of sociology or like anthropology because we didn't come up with anything besides capitalism, besides the current structure of society in the present days. But it seems to me like if we don't have that kind of change, we couldn't fix any of like current um, problems. So, so yeah, so I think right now we're at the tipping point or turning point of history that everyone should rethink about the whole thing from scratch, like whether we are on the right track or not, because it seems to me like capitalism is just pushing everyone on the cliff. So the next step could be totally jumping off the cliff and we're gonna do. So what's the solution? What's the new imagination of the society and how to mobilize people with that kind of narrative? So that's the question for the future of science fiction in my perspective. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Emily Jing. After Emily's question, we are going to read out uh, a question in chat. Yeah, Emily, please. Uh, hi, Professor Chen. It's an honor to hear you speak today. Um, it was an absolutely fascinating talk that you gave. And my main question actually comes from how you talked about your efforts are basically surrounded on this de-dichotomizing these kind of humanly created um, constructions of machine and human, for example. Um, also, as you mentioned, um, the being in, uh, enclosed within kind of the domestic nation and this international community. So I think it's fascinating how your position puts you right in the middle of that. But um, my question actually is more about how you're also essentially crossing the bounds of genre here, um, because in the contour of Chinese science fiction history that you gave just now, um, you mentioned how science fiction experiences own um, ebbs and flows and blooms. And currently, I think the way that Chinese science fiction is being discussed and of course being marketed, and you definitely know more about this than I do, um, how would you reconcile your position as previously a science fiction author and nowadays as an author who simply just, um, I guess, occupies a very important role in the study of contemporary Chinese literature in general? So how would you view science fiction moving into mainstream and your own position within that? Thank you. Thanks, Emily. So Emily actually is one of the brilliant um, translator and, and researcher on Chinese science fiction as well. So yeah, she translated uh, uh, many of my short stories. And, and yeah, so thanks for the question. I think um, 
I think um, right now I position myself as a as a medium. So I think um, I'm trying to bring in more um, from tech. Um, philosophy and even like traditional um, Chinese or Eastern culture and put it in the melting pot uh, of science fiction because I think right now it seems to me like all these boundaries of like disciplinaries is kind of solid and, and, and high. So, but uh, as a science fiction writer, you can do a lot of things which like scholars could could not. So you can put a lot of ridiculous thinking, for example, how to bridge the, 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 this science um, framework with mystical uh, myth, mysticism practice together. So using the narratives for sure. I think this is something totally fascinating because uh, science fiction as a genre, it has this kind of inclusiveness. It can put in different kind of perspective and different kind of um, values and, and even belief system and make it coherent. So that's where we can find the cracks and tension between different parties and different entities. And I think from there we can create and we can start to discuss this kind of interchangeable or inter, inter interaction of different discourses. So that's how I put myself as a medium. So I'm like, just like a hub, a, an information hub. I'm just trying to absorb like, like, like spawn, uh, uh, absorbing different kind of information from different uh, disciplinaries and I try to melt it like cooking uh, as, a, as a dish. So, so, and everyone can taste a little bit, see if you like it or not. And I can, I think I, I can start um, like trigger, like evoke some different, totally distinguished uh, response to the, to, the, to the dish, to the, to the cuisine. And I think that's how we can put everyone on the same table and to discuss something seriously, it's a bigger, question at the bigger perspective to help people to see the whole picture be their own limitation of disabilities. So that's how I put it, like even like cross different cultures, because right now, you know, China and US, they're kind of in this kind of bizarre war. And also the rest of the world is kind of separate each other like isolation and also because of the COVID like, um, yes. So things become super interesting and like the world is, seems to me like falling apart. So I think the, the very small efforts I can make here is to write something, storytelling and to link it, to reconnect people and trying so hard to bring everyone together back to the table and discuss about our future. Hey, thank you so much for your response. And I just want to shout out briefly before I turn the floor over to other people's comments that um, I think your words, are, uh, your words and also your works are absolutely valuable um, to all of us working disciplines of contem uh, contemporary literature in general. And that also a shout out to your efforts in crossing all of these boundaries um, between not just the human and machine, but also multiple cultures and languages as especially represented in AI 2041. And looking forward to how you represent the idea of the personal psyche and spirituality in your future works. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, our next two questions uh, from the chat is regarding the AI. And this question is that, what are some challenges you encounter in collaborating with AI? And uh, another question from Annie Sheng. Uh, she is also a sci-fi writer and a PhD candidate uh, in anthropology here at Cornell. Annie asks that, how will AI reconfigure the way we consider work and also creative work? And how we can understand AI's 
and the robots uh, to be culturally specific. So for example, how a Chinese uh, AI robot will, will be different with Japanese, uh, things like that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, so <clears throat> I think there are a lot of challenges um, while collaborating with AI. First, it's, it's totally uncontrollable because it's kind of random because we, we have this model, you input some keywords and like um, paragraph, like sentence, and it will automatically generate something from, from, from the algorithm. So all you can do is like select whatever you like or you dislike, you just regenerate another bunch of sentences. So I think actually is something in between, you, you, it, it makes you to read about the process of writing or creative writing itself. So actually it's like, it's like a mirror. So it reveals a lot of hidden structure of your own writing. So which is totally un unseen previously. So you feel that, okay, this is looks pretty much like me, but it's not from me. So which make you feel totally strange. And you need to starting from what is generated and you like continue from the flow and you write down something and it give you back. It's just pretty much like conversation. So it's like you are talking to one of your avatar or like uh, your performance towards the mirror. So it's that kind of imitation game. So I think it's something even more interesting when the, the, the algorithm evolve, like it evolves so fast that it's like month by month, it rise better and better. And it will feel like it's like a kid, it's, grow, it's growing and it learns so much things from the external world. And it learned a lot of like how this world's gonna run, how this world gonna uh, uh, operating. And on certain point, you'll feel that, okay, it has some kind of, on cer some certain level of agency and it will trigger you back, like force you to think from totally different direction from what you previously thinking. So I think that's the point when you, when you get to it, you think about, okay, this is something really changing the way I write and changing the way I think about the subject uh, I'm, I'm handling. So I think in the future, you'll become even more interesting. And, and, and I think this is something people would love to explore in the future. So for Annie's question, let me see. So it's talking about like how different culture is uh, reflecting in AI, right? So in my understanding. Oh, yes, uh, first is about uh, how AI reconfigure the way we consider work and also creative work. And also next one is yep. about the culturally specific. Right, it's, I think, yeah, I think AI totally um, will resh uh, reshape um, how we define work and especially create work because right now we can see so many artwork no matter it's like painting sculptures or even like nft so they are all generated by ai but during this process actually there's data is from human and human is the future which sel select those artwork uh, from their own preference so i think this is something 
um, very interesting because I before that we all think that create creativity is something very unique mm -hmm. and maybe only by human. But now it seems to me like um, it just uh, criteria. It just how you put it as creative. And I think in the future, even it's, it, it, it will be like indistinguished from what is made by human, what is made by AI. And, and even like our standards of what is good art, what is real creative will be influenced and changed by all this kind of artwork created by AI, because you think if you think about it, like AI can generate so many stuff in a nanosecond and it's spreading around on social media. So it's totally changing the way you perceive the artwork and you how to identify the art, the, the, build, the beauty of art. So I think in the future that's gonna be happen. So because you you're viewing, you're seeing, you're accepting so many AI generated artwork and it become part of your standards. And you start to think about like maybe AI is doing better job than human beings and they define the criteria of creative work. So I think And I, I'm not sure, like, <clears throat> human experience is the embodiment experience is still unique and is irreplaceable for now because AI doesn't have a body and robots, they don't have the sensory system. So I think that's something um, we still can say, we still can a claim that were unique for now until they have a body, until they have their own sensory system, which is quite terrifying, I have to say. So, and also on cultural specific, I think, yeah, for sure, because all this data set we fed in to the machine is kind of like culture based. So for example, we treating the, the, the algorithm with like gigatons of data set from Chinese internet content. So that's definitely totally different from those GPT trained content over the internet. So I think this is something, but I mean, the algorithm will amplify and even like review the deeper structure within the language and within the, the social uh, constructive concepts, expressions, emotion, responses as well. So I think in the future, maybe there'll be um, the new emerging disciplinary about like researching uh, AI. So uh, doing research on all this uh, AI generated content and try to figure out is another kind of compar and comparative lit, but on AI, not on human. So I think there's something could very likely to happen. So I'm pretty looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you so much. Our meeting actually uh, ends at 9 p.m., but we got more and more uh, questions from the chat. I guess we can, we have more time to accommodate two more questions from the chat. They are all regarding the Chinese sci-fi writing. First one is about your op opinion about uh, female sci-fi writing, particularly Hao Jingfang's winning of Hugo Prize in 2016. The next one is about uh, uh, Chinese sci-fi during the May 4th movement period, considering that many canonical works were published in this era. Uh, Sun Li would like to know, um, hear more about the relationship between modern Chinese sci-fi literature and the literary aesthetic of realism. 
Yeah, I guess Professor Chen could yeah, share some remarks about these two questions. Firstly, about uh, female Chinese uh, sci-fi writing and uh, also about realism. Yeah, okay. I, I think, um, first of all, I think there are so many extraordinary female writers um, in China, uh, especially in the genre of science fiction. And also there's one uh, newly arrived um, um, publication entitled The Way the Spring Arrived. So actually it's like uh, co-editing by Emily Jean and, and Jia and, and Kan Yu Wang. So, and this is the first an, an anthology of Chinese female and non-binary writers so there are so many fascinating stories in the book. So I think um, right now, uh, also um, I, I'm I'm the editor of um, a set of four volumes of uh, Chinese female science fiction writer as well uh, in Chinese. So it's called Pa Ke Huan. So I think we need more female voices, we need more um, diverse angle on science fiction writings, because as you can see, there's long history of like tradition, like male dominant in the field, because like when you're talking about science fiction, the first reaction to the people is like, okay, this supposed to be boys toys, boys stuff, right? So it's like written by boys and read by boys. So it's basically like big boys escapism uh, recreation, but actually it's not true. So I think in history of feminism, science fiction, Fiction actually play a very important role to push forward the movement of liberation and equality. So I think as well as in China, we are we need it like even more urgently because everything you can see, everything you can read from the news. I think science fiction definitely could be a very powerful narrative tool to help people to think beyond the status quo, and to think about what could be possible for the future. Because in my opinion, like the world will be much, much more better if leading by female and non-binary. So <laughs> because of the, the, of the nature of male and patriarchy society, everyone can see from the reality is kind of shithole. So I think this is something we need to do and we need to do more. We need to hear, we need to encourage more female non-binary writers to have their own voice and that have their stories read and heard. So that's my opinion. And for the reality, I think because Chinese literature, we have so long and deep tradition on realism. So that's also from Soviet Union as well. <clears throat> and of course, there's one short time window when 1980s, when reopen and open up and reforming, and there's so many uh, modernism and even postmodernism literature brought into China and people like a, a bunch of avant-garde writers back in the day, they're, they're so-called avant-garde. They, they try a lot of like writing experiments, but it didn't go big or didn't big enough to become mainstream, I, I have to say. So right now, um, still, the realism, and especially in this kind of very old tradition, like 
socialism, realism, and as kind of talking about re reflecting the reality in a positive way. So it's actually, I think it's changing, uh, it's shaping the perception of the writers and readers as well. So I think it's kind of difficult to find a way out. So even like in science fiction, so I think, yeah, because I, I, I use the term science fiction, no realism as a <clears throat> strategy, try to break through because you, you, I try to like in a sneaky way. So because you're talking about realism, people would think, okay, we're in, in the same boat, but actually we're using a science fictional realism is actually reviewing the hidden reality, reviewing all this kind of folding reality. So I think because there's so many different layer, layers of reality, which could be virtual, could be spiritual, could be like divided by class and different interest party, but most of them could not be told in a very realistic uh, realism way. But as science fiction, you can, you can transform all those uh, message and you can metaphorically um, changing the, the, the um, coding of the story and make it visible and people still relate to it. And people even like find it even more um, <clears throat> relevant because it's, it's metaphorical because it's not limits in prison days, not in this country, this society, but it also like reflecting the reality in different society, even in the future or in the past. So I think that's why science fiction become so interesting and so important to be the opinion is the biggest realism for now and future. So I think in the future, maybe science fiction could be the only realism literature, not only in China, but also around the world. So that's my opinion. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating answer and for this very, very impressive uh, lecture. Uh, I have studied a lot from this lecture and I believe uh, this lecture not only talks about uh, Chinese sci-fi, not only about what literature, but also about how literature can uh, have this kind of word making power. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Chen, for this wonderful talk. And I also thank everyone who came to this lecture. And uh, I sincerely hope that uh, one day we can invite Professor Chen to come to our Cornell campus. And also to, we can also have the opportunity not only to read your works, but also to see the NFT, the artworks as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we will send the link of the lecture video as soon as possible. And now uh, feel free to uh, turn on your audio and video to give Professor Chen a uh, applaud. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>